You're listening to Blue Jays Nation Radio with Cam Lewis and Tyler Uremchuk, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. Welcome in to episode 209 of Blue Jays Nation Radio. We've got Coomzy, that is me. We have got producer Brett filling into the analyst spot. I am hosting because I think right now Tyler's flying back from Los Angeles. He flew to LA thinking he's going to watch the Toronto Blue Jays face the Los Angeles Dodgers and didn't realize this was a home series in Toronto and just wandered around the Dodgers stadium parking lot Friday, Saturday, and Sunday with his arms in the air trying to figure out where the baseball games were happening. But what did wind up happening was Shoei Otani arrived in Toronto and the Dodgers won two of three from the Blue Jays, a big win on Friday for LA. 12-2, 12-2, to two, and then a 4-2 win on Saturday, but the Blue Jays salvaged the series with a 3-1 win on Sunday. Brett, what did we think about that series against the mighty L.A. Dodgers? It went basically exactly how we thought it would. We were talking about uh, uh, just before we came on. It went basically how we thought it would. The Dodgers' bats were, I mean, the elite bats were going there. Especially, though, in that last game, the bottom of the lineup really showed how stringent it can kind of be there. But it, the the Dodgers bats just proved to be exactly what we all thought they would be. Yeah, it's a difficult top of the order to shut down. You got Mookie Betts leading off with a, at the end of the first game, at the end of Friday, because he went two for three in that game. After that game, he had an OPS of 1.130. And then right behind him, Shoei Otani. 1100 OPS at the end of the game on Friday, of course, in his first at bat, he's batting second top of the first inning. The fans are all booing. Everyone's sitting there remembering those cold, dark winter days when we were sitting there looking at our phone, tracking the flight across the country. You know, the whole saga, fans were excited. Shoei Otani is going to be a Blue Jay. Didn't happen, so people are pissed off. They're kind of booing him. Maybe they're kind of booing Ross Atkins. Maybe they're just booing life in general, but... As we predicted in the last podcast, we predicted this one perfectly. We we all sort of knew this was coming. It really, really, really felt inevitable. In Otani's first at bat in Toronto, he launched a solo home run off of Chris Bassett, and the fans were like, "Ah, what, 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 what are we doing here? We could have had this guy." Yeah, and it's it, obviously a ballpark that he hits well in, or has hit well in in the past. The series, not so much, but. Um, you did kind of see it. I remember I was in the office when it happened, he hit it and I just went, he did it. You knew he was going to do it. It, it was like, uh, uh, Houdini getting out of his, his cuffs. He was like, Oh, shocker. He did it. No, it, it was almost the perfect curtain call for, uh, uh, Shohei Otani when he's getting all those booze is just Watch that ball, and that's going to be a souvenir. And that would have been great. It would have been exactly what this Blue Jays lineup needed right about now. Yeah, could you imagine having that nice, big, left-handed, power-hitting bat right in the middle of the lineup? It sure would look real good. But, hey, that's life. The Blue Jays didn't sign Shoei Otani. What do you think about fans booing him? Like, there's uh, on the last podcast, Tyler talked about it, and he got fired up about it. We know he's pissed off about it still, but you're a half-and-half fan. You're a Blue Jays fan slash Dodgers fan, so you got a weird little bias going on. But if you're putting on only your Blue Jays hat and you forget about L.A. for a second... Do you think Blue Jays fans are, are really justified in, in booing a guy who showed, le- I think, showed legitimate interest in signing with them, but then didn't? Is, is this justified? I, I do think it's justified. I mean, fan bases are going to feel slighted by the littlest of things. We know that. We've seen it in years past. of The little things players will do and they'll go, oh, I hate this guy forever. Shohei Otani, on the other hand, didn't exactly do something tiny. I mean, I remember, again, when we thought we were tracking Shohei Otani's plane, and, oh, my God, he's landing, and he's here. There's a press conference that's going to happen at 4, and we're all like, we. I mean, we had merch already ready for this guy, for, for BJN. Like, this was, it seemed like a foregone conclusion. We were just waiting for the good old wave from the uh the the plane and go wow he's here it's done but i understand it uh i also understand that there is an entire plan not necessarily plan but there has to you're you're a free agent you're trying to get the most amount of money the best possible situation as you can in whatever given team that you're in so if you're 
And I don't really believe in the whole, oh, he was using the Blue Jays for leverage thing here. Um, because he was given, apparently, that offer to every other team in that was in the running for him. So I do think it was warranted. But I I also think it's just a matter of fans being fans and going, that guy was almost a J. That was almost the best J of all time. So I think there's a little bit of a give and take for it, too. He had what I thought was probably the right quote to say after, just to kind of feel the, like whether whether he believes what he's saying or not, but he said the right thing, which was fans boo opposing players out of love for their own team. You can feel the love for the game of baseball. And I have a great respect for that. I mean, I think what he's saying is, is pretty accurate. Like whether the booing, it probably didn't bother him at all. Maybe it charged him up a little bit, but this is just one of those things in sports that I think is pretty harmless. Like it's something for fans to care about something to get them fired up, something to bring them out to a ballpark are the ballpark on a Friday night and get them going. I don't think it's terribly malicious or, or anything. I think baseball needs more of these sort of sort of little weird rivalries, just different reasons. Like there's no reason for the Blue Jays and Dodgers to have any rivalry whatsoever or any sort of beef or, or really interest, anything interesting beyond just, you know, the big names in the matchup. But if the Blue Jays, if Blue Jays fans feel they've been slighted by Otani because his agent didn't come on Twitter that afternoon and tell everybody that he wasn't actually on the flight, then sure, feel pissed off about it and go ahead, continue to boo him every time you face him. It is uh, it is what it is. It's just good for the banter. That was our first down of the series. It isn't even really a down. It was more just a thing to talk about, kind of like a funny and interesting thing. The second down I have was Chris Bassett got lit up pretty badly on Friday. And I mean, as we both know, this is a very good LA Dodgers lineup. So it's not like, you know, Chris Bassett got lit up by the Colorado Rockies or something like that. But two and two thirds innings pitch, seven earned runs on nine hits, three walks, four strikeouts, and he also allowed two dingers. Chris Bassett, the hound on the mound, the, the rubber arm, the innings eater, has a 5.64 ERA for the season. It's been a little bit of a mixed bag. There was some really good starts. Remember the one against the New York Yankees, but then also some, some difficult ones too. He had a hard time early in the season against Tampa, against Houston, and then here against the Dodgers as well. Is there is there any cause for concern about, God, uh, about Bassett, or is this just one of those starts against a good team? I don't think there's cause for concern. I don't think concern would be the word that I would use, but I have found with Bassett that once it starts kind of piling on early, it just kind of keeps going. Um, he was able to recently, uh, not his start against the Jays, but I believe his last one before that, I don't remember which one it was, but uh, got, had beat up a little early on and then he got to kind of get into his rhythm a little bit. I think you're going to a see that more from Bassett down the stretch in the season, but it's got to start kind of now, if you're going to see some sort of st stability from him, I I'm not a non-believer in Chris Bassett. Obviously. I mean, we have seen the track record in the past of Chris Bassett. So I think this is just kind of a, I don't want to say a rough start for the Blue Jays pitchers because in the games they have won, it has been their pitching that has won them their games. So I think that would be too much of a damper on what this pitching staff has been able to accomplish and Chris Bassett included. Um, but I think you kind of want to see some sort of progression in Chris Bassett in the rest of, well, most of the pitching staff here uh, coming forward here. Yeah, I'm on the same page. I'm kind of just like, I mentioned this in the last episode, and it feels like the Blue Jays are pitching in high leverage spots all the time, like they're starters. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get to this when I <clears throat> when I get to down number three here, which is the streak of not scoring more than five runs in the game is continued here. The Blue Jays could only manage two runs on the Friday, two on the Saturday, and three runs on Sunday. So now it's 20 consecutive games dating back to April 6th when they're at Yankee Stadium that they've scored five or fewer runs. And that's kind of what I was saying with, with, with the Bassett point just there was that there isn't really much room for the pitching staff. And I think that's pretty taxing, like going out there and throwing every fifth day and trying to be an innings muncher is one thing, but then going out into games where you're probably not really expecting your, your lineup to spot you more than three, four or five runs. 
it's 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 high leverage spot it's high leverage spots and i don't think we can think chris bassett's going to go through and have 30 35 starts of you know all pure quality like it's it's a pretty big expectation especially when you're going up against a team like la mookie bet Shohei otani freddie freeman um like that's a the, probably one of the best if not the best one two three you're gonna have in baseball right i can't really think of too many teams that have that much at the top of their lineup no no goodness no and and but the issue was was you saw that firepower in game one you saw just next guy up boom next guy up boom next guy walk next guy like it, it with that start top of the lineup that can also go through the rest of the lineup too it can be very difficult to get through, and you saw that in game one. However, on the flip side, and I'm sure we're going to get to this later, it was the pitching and the defense that won them that last game, that that third game there. And again, that kind of goes back to what I was saying in the long lines of uh, you can't be too hard on the pitching staff because when you're going out and beating teams like the L.A. Dodgers, holding them to a one-run game, you're going to win that most times. But if all three of your runs come out in the first, what, two innings, three innings, you kind of test in the waters a little bit more. I mean, they're lucky that Gavin Lux has been just an absolute shell of his a, like rookie self. He has been awful, and they sent out Michael Bush for the guy, and Michael Bush hit five homers in five straight games. And they're going, no, no, trust me, Gavin Lux will be fine. That bottom of the lineup for the Dodgers was what really won it, I think, for the Toronto Blue Jays. You were able to get basically past Andy Pajes, who was, has been an absolute revelation so far in his couple of weeks in, in Los Angeles right now. And it was just, it, it was like a sinkhole. Austin Barnes couldn't hit water if he fell out of a boat right now. Great defensive catcher, but just again, shell of himself from the last whenever he could perform back in the postseason 2017 so, yeah exactly i think <laughs> i was still in high school then i wasn't but um again that, that pitching though and the defense coming back to it the fact that they were able to a neutralize the top of the order and do what they needed to do at the bottom of the order was exactly what you want to see from the blue jays defensively and from their arms yeah, that's a good segue into I only have two ups for our three ups because I mean, let's be real here. I don't think there was three good things to take from that series. But the first up, the the big thumbs up, and I thought the most positive thing from this series definitely was that Kevin Gosman looked like his dominant ace self in what I think was definitely his best start of the season, just given the context. He went seven innings, allows just one earned run on five hits and struck out five batters. It was his longest outing of the season just slightly longer than his last outing in kansas city when he went six and two thirds but before that it was a bit of a struggle for gosman you'll remember the start in new york which was his second of the year only made it through made it through four outs and allowed five earned runs the one against colorado back at home a light hitting lineup three and two thirds innings six earned runs and then one at home against the yankees which was fine but it was only five innings and one earned run Gosman now looks like the pitcher the Blue Jays need. He was, of course, injured during spring training, couldn't have his normal ramp up, and his starts against Tampa, New York, Colorado, those ones that I just mentioned, they're kind of like regular season spring training starts. So I don't think anybody was sitting there being critical of Kevin Gosman, but what it was was the Blue Jays didn't have their ace for the first few weeks of the year, but now it looks like this is the Kevin Gosman the Blue Jays need. It looks like he's himself again. My favorite part about that start was John Schneider giving him that leash a little bit. He hey, he had been really throwing well in that game, and he very easily could have just, hey, the numbers say uh, going through the lineup for the third time in a row, just it's not a good thing, and give him the yank. They didn't. They let him throw out the rest of his his really good, his best start of the season so far. And if you're able to get him going now, we talked about Bassett a little bit earlier too. And you already have the obvious success so far this year of Jose Barrios. Once those three can keep going here, Kikuchi is thrown well again. And Yariel Rodriguez, I thought he threw well uh, against Kansas City too. Just kind of uh, unlucky in some senses there too. I mean, if you can get Gosman going here, it's going to be a very, very fruitful future, hopefully, 
on the pitching staff, on the arms, defensively, and preventing runs in order to try and help this offense to go and win more ball games. And speaking of the offense, our second up now is a player that had on Sunday what we're all hoping is going to be a breakout performance, which is Alejandro Kirk. He had his best game of the season offensively, went three for three and hit a home run. It was his first home run of the season, and I'm I'm looking at his game logs. And after that Kansas City game, the last game that he played, the five-inning one, he went over two in that one. And his OPS at the end of that game was 451. And then after the three for three day with the home run, the solo bomb, his OPS jumped all the way up over 100 points to 567 which is, hey, maybe we're, we get this kind of progression as time goes along and you just see another jump like that in his next game. We're all hoping that Alejandro Kirk's about to start a hot streak because it's been a while since since we saw him at the plate look like that all-star hitter, right? Like he was an all-star in his first full season. He won a silver slugger and then hasn't really been the same hitter since. The defense has been there behind the plate, which is great, but... This is a player who, of course, the Blue Jays thought highly enough of Kirk that, I mean, this isn't the full reason it happened, but they thought highly enough of Kirk that they were comfortable moving Gabby Moreno in a trade. Um, It's one that a lot of Blue Jays fans have been critical about, but when Kirk's good, he's good. And it was a game like this on Sunday makes you remember a couple years ago, this guy was an all-star and a silver slugger. He's a damn good catcher. Yeah, he used to walk more than he would strike out, and now he strikes out more than he sees pitches somehow, which is weird. Um, But (laughs) um, you mentioned the defense, which for me is the biggest thing, and not only as the player, but to try and help his bat. His defense, he is... He has the most framed strikes of any catcher in all of baseball right now. He is helping that pitching staff and helping that team prevent runs. Now, on the flip side, you need him to also produce runs at the plate, and which obviously we saw against a a really good Dodgers team was the pitching situation kind of in the third game. (laughs) Yeah, sure, that's fair. But to be able to not only get the homer there, but to get on base three times, three for three, keep that back going again. Like it, it seems like a weird situation behind the plate because you want to see Danny Jansen hitting well, but every single time that he kind of gets into some sort of rhythm and, and, and really hitting well, he gets hurt. He breaks his wrist somehow and an inside slider that gets away and hits him in the same spot for the third year in a row. Or Alejandro Kirk is ice cold at the plate and we all sit here and go, mm, yeah, but he did become a dad last year. So <laughs> there, there's, it, it's, you need, more consistency from those, uh, not only Alejandro Kirk and uh, Danny Jansen, but uh, just both Alejandro Kirk in general. It's really good to see. I just want to see him keep it going. It's For me, it's the consistency. It's great that you can go three for three in a game against the LA Dodgers in the series finale, but can you do it in game one, game two against the Kansas City Royals in the following series? So let's kind of keep it going here for him. Obviously, the glove and the defensive play is still there for him. So he's going to stay in the lineup and he's going to get opportunities to keep that back going. Let's work on it and, and keep that back going. One final Dodgers related thing to bring up, and this doesn't really fit into the up or the downs. This is sort of just <clears throat> this is sort of just a general comment was Teoscar Hernandez spoke to Shai Davidi over the weekend. Of course, this was also Teoscar Hernandez's return to Toronto. He was with Seattle last year, played the Blue Jays in Toronto early in the season, and is now back after joining the LA Dodgers on a one-year contract in the offseason. He talked to Shai Davidi over the weekend about his free agency, and he said, at the beginning, the Blue Jays said to not forget about him. But obviously, when we exchanged numbers and years and all that stuff, they said they couldn't go that that far in terms of length, and that was about it. So basically, what this kind of shows is that the Blue Jays had an interest in Teoscar Hernandez, and this was before he wound up signing his one-year deal with the Dodgers, which was essentially the qualifying offer. The qualifying offer this year, of course, was one year and $20.4 million, I think it was. And Teoscar got slightly more than that from LA, but it's all being deferred like Otani and the other contracts. So a little bit weird, but given what we saw with the Blue Jays in the offseason, they weren't handing out any long-term contracts. Like They didn't wind up nailing one of those bigger names like Chapman 
uh, on the re-signing or Cody Bellinger, who wound up re-signing with uh, the Cubs. The signings they did make were, you know, Kevin Kiermeyer, Isaiah Kiner, Falafa, Justin Turner, all deals that are one or two year deals. So Teoscar might have been looking for a three or four year deal and the Blue Jays weren't as interested in doing it. And he's had a pretty decent start to the season. He's been like a nice depth hitter for for los angeles in the middle of their order and i think a lot of fans can say pretty clearly like blue jays fans miss having teoscar in the lineup but as much as you miss him and i'm one of the guys who last trade deadline when there was talk about maybe getting teoscar i was all for it this offseason i was for it as well but when you kind of look at it it's sort of you wonder well where is he going to fit? Because if you have Teoscar on your team, he's probably going to DH a lot, but they've already got Justin Turner instead, and Turner's been really good this year. You can't really complain. I think the spot for Teoscar, I guess, would be George Springer's spot in right field, but you can't really have them both in the roster. I understand why fans are upset that, that that or they miss Teoscar, I guess. I wouldn't say I understand why they're upset, but I, I, I understand that they miss him, but I'm just not sure the, the fit really makes sense. What do you think about that? I think he would be exactly what the Blue Jays would need to win. They are lacking power. I yep. mean, let's let, let's call a spade a spade here. They're lacking power, and they're lacking the ability to cash in runs, and that's what Tay Oscar is able to do. I mean, Justin Turner is your best hitter. 39-year-old <laughs> Justin Turner. 39-year-old <laughs> Justin Turner who 10, 15 years ago got DFA'd by the New York Mets for the Los Angeles Dodgers like that. And, and as somebody who has watched Justin Turner for years, who is a really, really strong technical hitter, he's a great hitter, but he shouldn't be your best hitter on the team. And to be able to have a guy like Teoscar Hernandez, who can cash in runs, who can hit absolute bombs and a guy who is also familiar with the team and the city and the culture, it would have been mwah, perfect. And then you see him at the start of the year as well, pop off with like four homers in the first yeah. two, three series. That really hurts because then you remember, Oh shit, this guy can hit still too. So I, I understand why i mean hell he's getting paid a hell of a lot of money and down the stretch for him too his family is going to be perfect when he gra or graduates retires i i just really do think the blue jays really missed out on not having one more massive hitter and his name's not daniel vogelback so i, I just i I really do think the Blue Jays missed on this one. I know there's only so much somewhere you can put him, but I think he's exactly what you need on this team. Especially for the vibes too, right? I mean, feels like he was one of those uh, vibe champions that they had when the, when times were good, but Teoscar Hernandez, no longer a Blue Jay. He picked up three hits in that series. Uh, no home runs though. That, that, that is one thing, just three singles. So, Teoscar Hernandez, no dingers against the Blue Jays at the Rogers Center. We will take a break now that we have finished talking about the LA Dodgers. And on the second half, we will preview yet another series against the Kansas City Royals. And we will take a look around the American League East. We are back. We are going to take a look around the American League East, which had some really weird, interesting results. Um, the Tampa Bay Rays are now clearly or not clearly it's only one game back of the blue jays but they're on their own in last in the american league east they were swept by the chicago white Sox this weekend how does that happen uh, how does that happen and you know what i think the rays really fooled us at the start of the year i think yandy diaz got into that really hot start for absolutely no reason but ever since then i mean <sighs> Tampa Bay has battled injuries. We know there are problems with the pitching staff. Um, and the fact that Aaron Savali could potentially be your number one pitcher right now is kind of concerning too, arguably. But he's been worse as his starts go on. I was checking his uh, ERA in the last couple of games for or his uh, each game that he played the other day. And each game they went up from like a 1.29 to a 1.37 to a 4.2 to a 7 to a 9. Like it, that's concerning. And I think that's also kind of what we're seeing in the Rays 
season is that a they're just getting maybe not worse is the right way to put it. They're not getting the results that we thought they would uh, uh, as we keep going. But B, I just don't see any real stars, I guess, on that team outside of Randy or Rose Arena. Like, I don't think there's anybody who's really carrying some sort of offense. I mean, Jose Caballero has been really good. He has, I believe, seven steals off the top of my head uh, this season. He has been really good for them as well. But, I mean, that that kind of – Yandy Diaz has seemed to kind of plateau from where he was off the top of the year. So, I'm kind of concerned from what I'm seeing from the Tampa Bay Rays here. I think they might be the the real basement dwellers of the AL East this year. They might be. The team that we thought that was going to finish in the basement was the Boston Red Sox, and they are now 16-13 and following two wins over the Chicago Cubs, one of which was a 17-0 spanking, and then the one on Sunday was a walk-off. So yeah, the Boston Red Sox are now two games up on the Toronto Blue Jays. They're in third place in the American League East. The Red Sox are an interesting team because they're dealing with a ton of injuries. I think three out of their five members of their starting rotation are now on the injured list. Only two of their main starters are still there. Some position players are banged up as well. And I saw a rumor that I'm not really sure if it was a rumor, if it was just speculation, but there was a suggestion that the Red Sox might be a nice suitor to sign former Blue Jay and current free agent Brandon Belt to give them a nice big left-handed bat. Maybe. I don't know. The Red Sox are off to a a decent start. They're off to, I think, a slightly better start than we would have expected. But I don't know. Maybe Brandon Belt's the the answer in Boston. (laughs) Yeah, well, I I think you kind of said it right there. It's a better start than we expected. And on top of that, I mean, they have had injuries on top of injuries on top of injuries on top of injuries. And I could see Brandon Belt getting a shot there. I mean, Tristan Cassis just went down with, uh, I believe he has two fractured ribs or or cracked ribs, if I'm not mistaken there. And he's going to miss some time. Uh, maybe I'm thinking of Cody Bellinger, but I know he has uh, injured ribs there. Um, it's cool to see, I guess, because it, it, you're kind of seeing the depth from them. Uh, uh, Sedan Rafaela has been, I'm sure I'm saying that name wrong, but Rafaela has done really well in his uh, first real test, I guess, in the MLB. Um, uh, what's the other name? Willier uh, Abreu as well has had a pretty decent first couple of games up here this year for the Red Sox. So they're getting players who can plug in a- and be productive on this team. And that's what you need. It's funny because it's kind of the polar opposite, not polar opposite, I guess, of what the Blue Jays get. But when uh, uh, Kevin Kiermeyer goes down, you call up Addison Barger to go out and play outfield, who's never played an inning of outfield before, and you're like, <laughs> "Best of luck, buddy." Um, and you're not you're not getting that production, I guess, from him because you're not putting him in the right situation. The Red Sox, however, have been able to supplement those injuries. Guys like Tyler O'Neill, who was the MLB league leader in home runs to start the year and gets smashed in the face by Rafi Devers, and Rafi Devers has to miss time as well. And those are just some of the position players, not to mention the pitchers that have gone down, like Brian, I know I say it wrong all the time, I'm still going to say it, Brian Bayo. It's Bello, whatever. Uh, he's gone down recently as well. Uh, Lucas Giolito's gone down. Nick Pavetta, Garrett Whitlock. Like they have a laundry list of injuries, but the fact that they're still not only competitive, but above the Toronto Blue Jays right now is very impressive. Maybe a testament to the work that Hyam Bloom did there during his few seasons. He was much maligned by fans in Boston. They did not like the Hyam Bloom years, but eh, the prospects, the farm system in Boston, they ain't bad. So... Uh, moving along, though, the um, the Baltimore Orioles lost two of three to the Oakland Athletics, who were surprisingly not as bad this year as I I, I would have expected. They were way worse last year. Um, the interesting thing about Baltimore, though, the big story there now is that number one prospect Jackson Holiday has been sent back down to AAA after 10 games. He um, only has two hits across those 10 games and has a 0.59 batting average. The OPS is at 170, struck out 18 times, and has only walked twice. Uh, There was interesting comments by Baltimore's GM, and he talked about how, I mean, 
there's there's only so much data you really have on situations like this. You got a 20 year old who's putting up the numbers he did in the in the minors and through 12 games at AAA this year in April, he put up a 986 OPS. He walked 13 times and struck out nine times. It's kind of like, what can you really do? Like it's it seems as though the gap between AAA and the majors is is significantly high. But we saw this with Vladimir Guerrero Jr. too. Of like he absolutely lit up AAA, and then he came up and didn't do the same thing. And people asked, well, you know, why'd you bring him up so quickly? But the same people who all said that were the ones being like, oh, the only reason he's down right now is to manipulate his service time. Blah blah blah. And I mean, you just don't know sometimes. You don't know if a guy's going to kill it in AAA and then come up to the majors because also consider the other pitching he's going to face. Nobody wants to be the guy who's going to allow the first career home run to some 20-year-old phenom. Nobody wants that. You don't want to be that guy. So I would bet you that all the opposing pitchers were, were, were finding a little bit of an extra gear for Jackson Holiday when he was up. What do you think about that whole situation? You don't think there's... There's no talk about bust whatsoever, is there? There's no suggestion that that's going to be the case. No, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is that's probably what my batting line would have looked like, too, if I got called up. I did. You think you'd get two hits? I, I probably could fist a couple through the middle of the infield and my hands would be sitting there going, ah, like my one uh, base hit off Mike Soroka in my career. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm going to bring that up right now. Um, but uh, no, there, there's no concern, I, I think, about Jackson Holiday. I mean, he came up with so much fanfare. And I think the big thing, too, that kind of goes against the cause for concern is it's the Baltimore Orioles. I mean, take a look at their entire basically roster and they're all guys they've drafted. They have brought up Joe Jordan Westberg. They just called up uh, uh, Heston Kerstad too. Adley Rutschman is arguably the best catcher in baseball. If they, if he's not already, he can be uh, uh, Colton Kowser has had a fantastic start to the year as well. I mean, I'm missing some Gunner Henderson. There we go. I'm mm -hmm. missing Gunner freaking Henderson. I mean, he's, he was a rookie of the year last year. So I'm not concerned about Jackson Holiday. I just think he needs some extra time. And I think the thing that also kind of helped Jackson Holiday at the start of the year was just how good the Norfolk Tides are. Like they are, they they seem like the Harlem Globetrotters of minor league baseball right now. You go in there and you're going, oh man, it's this guy, this guy, this guy. Now it's Jackson Holiday. Now it's Kobe Mayo. Like it's it's a tough team to go up and play against. And I think going into each game at AAA with your chin up high and knowing that your shit don't stink is kind of pretty easy to do. And then you go into the MLB and you're standing there across from Cutter Crawford, who is just like you said, he doesn't want to give up the first hit, uh, first homer to to a guy. And 18 strikeouts compared to his nine in AAA is not great, but I think that also gives him the not advantage, but gives him the experience of seeing major league pitching and being able to adjust from, okay, this was AAA, this was major leagues. I've seen what I've seen from the major leagues. Let's change what I did in the major leagues when I have these extra at-bats in the minor leagues. And so the next time I come up into the major leagues from the minor leagues, I'm just going to keep saying major and minor leagues. Uh, when I come back up from the minor leagues to the major leagues, I know what I'm doing and I can make an impact when I come back. So we do think he's going to be back at some point this season. I don't think Jackson Holiday is going to be down in AAA all too long. But moving along to our final American League East opponent, we have the New York Yankees who won two of three in Milwaukee. They were walked off on Friday. And then they won back-to-back uh, -back games by the score of 15-3. to three. The Yankees are now 19-10 and 10 on the season. And they're doing really quite well despite the fact that Aaron Judge hasn't been great this year. He's been fine. He has a 777 OPS. We would all take that on Toronto's lineup. But really the only guy who's who's been doing a lot of the heavy lifting for New York thus far is Juan Soto who's batting 318 997 OPS. The pitching's been fantastic despite the fact that there's no Garrett Cole just yet. The New York Yankees, they didn't make the playoffs last year, but they made the big trade in the offseason to get Juan Soto. They're in first in the AL East right now. Do you think they are the team to beat here, or is it still Baltimore? Nah, I think right now it's it's the New York Yankees. The the moves that they made this offseason 
were obviously very intentional. They wanted to be the best team in the AL East, and they weren't going to do it by having their own homegrown talents like the Baltimore Orioles. They were going to have to go out there, get on the market, and try and compete in that sense with guys off the market. You went and got Juan Soto. We also tend to forget that Trent Grisham was a part of that trade as well. Uh, uh, who is the other? Oh, and Alex Verdugo, former Dodger, mm-hmm. of course. How could I forget Alex Verdugo? Who... Uh, uh, centerpiece to the uh, Mookie Betts trade. And he has been fantastic for them too this year. I mean, it's the additions for the Yankees that have been fantastic. And they're without Garrett Cole. Nestor Cortez is keeping the, the, the barrel alive, keeping the, the ship afloat, I guess is what I'm trying to say here. Um, they're just getting contributions from everybody here and, and whether or not, you know what, you have the stat, do you still have the stats in front of you here for the Yankees? Yeah, I can pull them back up. I was looking, I just at, want, I was looking ahead to Kansas City, but I'll pull them back up. Oh, sorry, I again. just... I just wanted to know what Oswaldo Cabrera's numbers are right now because he started the year hot. He has been, outside of Juan Soto, one of the best contributors for that Yankees team. Yeah, 269 batting average, 719 OPS, uh, three dingers, four doubles, driven in 16 runs. Pretty solid from the outfield. 16 runs. And, and, hey, I'm pretty sure he's playing third base for them. Right yeah, he's actually so. playing third base. Yeah, he was an outfield the last year, third base this year. The Yankees are the Yankees are doing their thing. The starting rotation has been good, too. Nestor Cortez, like you mentioned, 350 ERA. Rodon last year after that disaster season down to 2.48. Marcus Stroman, who always felt like he'd be a good Yankee, was is, is at 3.69, really good. Luis Gill down to 401. We remember him when he was pitching against the Jays, terrible command problems. And Clark Schmidt, 3.55 ERA to round it out. That's really good pitching. And the bullpen's strong mm-hmm. too. Like it, it I, I do agree. It looks like New York's division. Well, and you mentioned Luis Gill is is his location problem, but the other thing next to it too is he strikes out a lot of guys too. And I well, think two of his last three starts or two of his last four, he struck out eight. And in another one of those, he struck out six. So, I mean, once you're getting more than five strikeouts in a game, and he's done it three times this year, especially for a guy who just got his first career win. I think that those are impressive numbers. And the Blue Jays are three and three thus far against New York. They'll have one more meeting in New York, one more in Toronto. We'll see how those ones go. It's an interesting one. But next up this week, just after facing them last week four times, four miserable, unwatchable slugs, The Blue Jays will be back again to face the Kansas City Royals three times this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday series, before there will be an off day on Thursday, and then it will be on the road to face the Washington Nationals, the zombie corpse of the Montreal Expos, of course. (laughs) On Monday for the Blue Jays against Kansas City, it'll be Yariel Rodriguez going against a rookie named Jonathan Bolin, who has done... White Jonathan Bolin apparently has done quite well in AAA. 2.57 ERA and four games started since he's going up the blue against the Blue Jays in his first career start. It's probably going to be six shutout innings. It's going to be like the Ryan Merritt Mallet, whatever his name in situation. It's not always ideal when a pitcher makes their big league dig, debut against the Blue Jays. Game two, it's going to be Jose Barrios going up against Cole Reagans. This was the exact matchup that we had in that weird five-inning game uh, last week, the final of the series. Uh, Barrios allowed, of course, that two-run bomb to Sal Perez and then got saddled with a very unfortunate loss in that one. And then the third game in this series will be Chris Bassett, who, as we talked about earlier, just had a rough one against the Dodgers. Hopefully he rebounds against Kansas City. He's going up against Seth Lugo, who the <clears throat> Royals signed in the offseason and is doing very well. He's got a 1.66 ERA through six games started, 38 innings pitched in total. Uh, the Royals are a team that we kind of got used to for a few years being bad, and I don't think they're bad anymore. They're I don't know if they're a contending team, if they're going to make the playoffs when it's all said and done, but this isn't a team where you see them on the schedule and you're like, oh yeah, the Royals, there's an easy win, maybe a sweep. This is a this is a team that pitches well, they've got some good hitters, they're not a bad team at all. No, they're not a bad team at all, and kind of ish, similar-ish to um, the Baltimore Orioles relatively brought up from their homegrown talent. They're a smaller market that you heard Oh, there's a smaller market through. It was Bobby Witt Jr. signs his big contract with a smaller market team. 
But the Royals have always, uh, relatively always, there's been patches where they haven't been, but they've always been a very strong and or difficult out for not only the Blue Jays, but for a lot of teams. And now we're seeing the real growth and development of Bobby Witt Jr. We're seeing guys like Cole Reagan step up into very, very, very strong company too. He's obviously one of the best, not only pitchers on the staff or pitchers in the AL at all, but one of the best pitchers in the league too, and best young pitchers too. So, uh, It's interesting because I'm happy that it's not in Kansas City in that absolute hellhole of a baseball stadium. I can't stand that place. Even anytime, even playing in MLB the show, every time I play the (laughs) Kansas City Royals, I skip that shit. I can't, cannot stand that ballpark. Bad memories. Bad, awful memories. Oh no, (laughs) that just brought back the reach over. Uh, Thank you. Just thinking of, uh, just thinking of that called strike on Ben Revere. Thinking about that kid with the beard (laughs) reaching over. Thinking about. Dalton Pompey standing on third base, all of it. Oh, it's a stadium that I don't want to watch baseball there. That was a good one, too. But uh, no, I, I, I'm just happy that this is going to be inside a dome, too, because yep. you mentioned that Jose Barrios, uh, excuse me, start. That's his only loss in the year. And the guy didn't even get to put out an entire start he it, it, it was a a rushed game from the start the umpires were calling balls in the other box because oh crap guys we're gonna get wet here soon and they just called it off there so you need a bounce back i think you especially need a bounce back in this series after the dodgers series you saw glimpses of what you want from your offense especially early in that third game of the series go out there Jump them early, get your runs, let your pitching staff do their thing. You have three great starters in this series, Yariel Rodriguez, uh, Jose Barrios, and Chris Bassett. Go and utilize them, and also go and give them some sort of support. You, That is the biggest thing right now for the Blue Jays, is giving their pitchers support instead of their pitchers giving their batters support. Yeah, the Blue Jays need to score some runs, but... Just as Toronto has good pitchers going in this one too, like uh, this isn't going to be an easy one to score runs. And you, Jonathan Bolin, like I said, he's got those great numbers in AAA. Yeah, Blue Jays don't usually do well against guys in their debuts. Cole Raggins, you just got finished talking about. He's been excellent. Uh, and Seth Lugo, same thing, 1.66 ERA. So if I were to venture a guess, I'm going to go and say, I, I'm confident the Jays are going to win two of three in the series against Kansas City, but I do not think that they're going to, break their break their non-scoring run stretch i think it's going to be three more games with five or fewer runs i i don't think this series against kansas city is the one that we're going to see them finally pop off for some runs yeah yeah i don't disagree a i think if you could break it out of that curse you could jump uh um bowl in early and try and get into his head and be like hey this is the majors buddy you're in our home you're in our dome we're going to take advantage of this. I think that may be their best opportunity, or I also think they're going to take two or three in this one. I think they'll take the first game, lose the second game, win the third game, win the series ender once uh, Kansas City is ready to go off on their trip. Um, I think they might be able to maybe try and jump on them there too, but we'll see. That 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 would be my best opportunity for the Toronto Blue Jays is a either jump on the new guy early or b just let them have it on the travel day yeah true that the the getaway day which will be it'll be two evenings starts Monday and Tuesday and then Wednesday will feature a getaway day before the Blue Jays travel to Washington to face Walgreens um yeah that's all of it from us that's everything I got written down in the notes Brett thank you for jumping in and serving as the analyst I enjoyed being the host Tyler will be back from Los Angeles for our next one on Thursday unless he hits the or tries to wind up in Toronto to see them face the Nationals you never really know but (laughs) yeah so we should be back to normal later in the week it's going to be a bit of an up and down schedule with the NHL playoffs going on and whatnot but We will be back with something on Thursday. Hopefully we're talking about a series win over the Kansas City Royals, but we will find out. Brett, thank you again. Best wishes. Thanks for tuning in to Blue Jays Nation Radio. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode.